All right, it is nine o'clock and we want to respect your time and it takes us about the exact 90 minutes to get through this. So um, we will start right in. We are going to use Prezi today for our presentation. If you've not used Prezi before, it's called the Zooming Presentation Tool. It's free to us. We get a very nice membership as education um, folks and our students do as well. If you go to Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I.com, there's a free version and then there's a mid-level version. We get that mid-level version, which is a $59 a year cost, subscription cost for free because we're education. So using your Pitt State account, email account, you can actually sign up for this. So if you like this kind of tool, it's a little different than PowerPoint, you might consider using it. I'm Angela Neria, I'm the CIO here, and I think I know almost everyone except for you. Nice to meet you, Lamont. And I'm going to be presenting today, as well as Tim Pearson, Daryl Needham, and then Dr. Frieden is going to share with us um, her perspective from the Groupware Task Force that worked on the process. So we're going to talk about concerns with the current system. I know that we've all had been impacted by the issues that we've had with the current email and calendaring systems. We're going to explain what Groupware is. We're going to, Dr. Frieden's going to visit with us a little bit about the purpose and the process of the task force. And then we're going to have outcomes, share the products, demonstrate the products, and then we'll be asking for feedback. This is very open. Um, we will along the way say, does that make sense? Are there any questions? So feel free to speak up. In the sessions that we've had, the last six sessions, we've had a lot of conversation. And that's been really good because we've been able to take notes. And as we go back and complete um, FAQ sheets and those kinds of things, that information I think will really help us um, spread more information across campus because obviously not everyone can attend these sessions. So we'll get right, right to it with talking about issues with our current system. Okay. Thank you. All right, some concerns with the current system. Uh, first of all, I want you all to understand that this is not an accurate representation of what our email system looks like. Uh, the steering wheel on ours is made of uh, a different material. It's not this chrome. And uh, I also thought I'd let you know that's not me. But uh, this kind of gets the point across that uh, the existing hardware that the uh, email is, uh, runs on now is a little bit long in the tooth. It's some 19, circa 1970 vintage stuff. Uh, it was state of the art at its, uh, when it was new. And it's kind of a testament to uh, the quality of the hardware that IBM builds that it's still running at all at this point. Uh, so uh, basically, I think we all understand that we're, uh, we're dealing with a system that desperately needs to be updated. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, when, when, I was, when I was in college learning to be a computer scientist, I used one of those. I sure did. Okay, age we've talked about, reliability has been a problem. I think all of us are aware of some of the outages that we've had over the past few months. And part of that is due to the fact that the server uh, that we're using now runs all day with just its nose out of water. If anything extra happens, if there's any other occurrence, something that adds additional stress to the system, it goes under and then things begin to back up. So part of our reliability issue has to do with uh, capacity problems. When that system was new, email was a novelty. Uh, we didn't uh, use it every day like, like we do now. Uh, we didn't send emails with huge documents attached like we do now. So there's both of uh, uh, quantity and size of emails today were never envisioned uh, when this system was designed and put into service. Uh, the other thing is the way email information is stored is not in what we call a relational database, which means uh, the bigger your inbox is, the slower the system, uh, the longer the system takes to add a new in, uh, email to your inbox. The larger your saved email folders are, uh, the slower you access that information. Both of the new email systems that we'll be showing you today use uh, a database structure to store all of your uh, emails, meaning that it's basically about as fast uh, to access whether you have 10 or 10,000 uh, emails in your account. It uses a, a much 
updated indexing system to, uh, to locate and access uh, information. It's called a relational database. Then the other thing, because we were an early adopter of email at Pitt State, uh, the thing kind of grew organically. As I said, it began as a novelty. We really didn't know if this was going to take off. We didn't really know how much it was going to be used at that point. And uh, it, was, it was, in the beginning, like a lot of new technology is, it was more something that everyone played with to try to figure out how it worked. And uh, part of the legacy of those uh, early days are things like Susan John Smith in the library, whose email address is suzyq at pittstate.edu. And that's because in the early days, uh, we just picked whatever we wanted for an email address. It wasn't until much later when we began to see lots and lots of people getting online that we came up with the idea of doing first initial, last name uh, to, make, to give some predictability to what email addresses should be. Uh, so there's an example. The other example of lack of standards is on the client side. We have 31 flavors of email applications on various desktops around campus. We have some folks using Outlook, some folks using Outlook Express, some folks use Thunderbird, some folks use the Gorilla Mail application. <laughs> one of the three, Gorilla Mail 1, uh, At Mail, or Gorilla Mail 2. We have a, an embarrassment of riches in web email applications here. So uh, those are the things that we saw as problems with the existing email system. So, uh, how does email work? If we're talking about replacing the email system, what's that going to affect? How many, what gets replaced exactly? Uh, and this is a very simple block diagram that I came up with to show the pieces that go into uh, giving you the ability to send and receive email. You've got uh, something you probably don't consider that much as being a separate piece, but it is. And that's the software on either the uh, workstation, the laptop, or the mobile device. Uh, normally what we're using up there, Thunderbird, Outlook, Gorilla Mail, the email program, the program you actually launch when you want to view or send emails. On mobile devices, uh, generally an email program comes with a mobile device, or perhaps you went out to the uh, Apple Store or the uh, Android market and downloaded a different uh, email application. Those then reside on some hardware, and that communicates with an email server, and I've actually given us a, uh, kind of a numbered explanation of how that goes. So we create an email here, that's step one. It passes through whatever device we're using, that's step two. Hits the email server, number three, out through the spam filter into the internet. So one, two, three, four, five are the steps that an email goes through if we're delivering it off campus. It stops at three, of course, if you're delivering an email to another uh, Pitt State account holder. It goes up here and then goes back out to the other person and deposited in their inbox. Of course, if an email's coming in from the outside, it's 54321. That's the flow of incoming emails. So the question then is, if we're going to do a new groupware system, how does this uh, diagram change? What groupware means is that for uh, workstations and laptops, everybody's going to get a new number one. Uh, we will have a standard interface, something that everyone will uh, be able to collaborate back and forth on how things work. We can become experts. We can't become experts in 31 flavors. There's no way we can really give you the kind of support that you deserve when there's 31 flavors of email applications out there. So, new number ones for workstations and laptops, and we're going to, right now I don't have an application that I could send you out to the Android market or the uh, Apple App Store and say, go download this and it'll have everything you need for Pitt State email. That may be coming in the future, but right now that's not available. So we're going to have to use the email and calendar program that came on the mobile device but we do have a free add-on that you can download that will connect the calendar and the email on your mobile device to the calendar uh, and the email on the new email server. So you can create appointments. It's going to be two-way. You can create appointments on the mobile device and have them show up on your calendar on the workstation and vice versa. We'll also be able to sync contacts. So if you create an address book entry on your mobile device, that can flow up to the address book uh, in your uh, email program on your desktop. So we'll be able to give you some uh, two-way communications. And then the last thing, and this is the part that thrills Daryl and I the most, 
is we're going to completely replace number three. The old IBM mail system goes away and its software will also go away and be replaced by a new state-of-the-art virtual machine or, or actually a collection of virtual machines. And one of the things that does for us is if we begin to get complaints that email is running slow, I can literally turn up the dial and add more horsepower to the application that's running email. Uh, that will give us the ability to be a lot more reactive uh, when we get into those kinds of situations and allow us to remediate that uh, issue much more rapidly. If it was a physical server and it ran out of memory, we'd have to order memory, shut it down, install the memory, turn it back on. On a virtual machine, I go over and slide a little slider bar over that says this machine now has this extra memory available or uh, additional processors available. So we should be able to make a very reliable and much more responsive email system uh, because of that. Okay, what is groupware? We're talking about groupware. We're throwing that word around. What does it mean? Well, it kind of depends upon the vendor you're talking to. In this case, uh, the, the two applications that we looked at, uh, the term kind of refers to relatively similar components. In general, groupware is a suite of software applications that are gathered together in the same uh, interface that enhance your ability to work with other people and collaborate with others. Uh, in this case, the uh, collaboration pieces, the major components in the two systems that we're looking at is, of course, email. The second one is an integrated calendar, uh, and that calendar has the ability, of course, to create individual appointments or group appointments. So now everybody, whichever one of the two email systems you all choose, uh, everybody gets a calendar now. It's not just the folks that have asked for Oracle Calendar. You'll be able to create appointments with anybody on campus, and they'll be able to create appointments with one another now. Uh, the third component is uh, the ability to have a little to-do list, a kind of a poor man's project manager. You can create a task list, share it with others. Uh, the calendar can be shared with others. You can have multiple calendars uh, in both uh, applications. And lastly, uh, is the ability to have kind of the groupware analog of the P drive. You will be able to have a document repository where you can upload information, files, uh, programs, uh, documents, spreadsheets, whatever. But the difference between this and the P drive is you get to decide if and if so who you share that with. You have the ability to say, I want to share uh, they call them briefcases in one of the applications. I want to share this briefcase full of documents with these people and I want to give them the ability to only view but not change. Except for uh, Dr. Frieden and I'll give her the ability to also change and add new documents. And I get to pick that. I don't have to pick up the phone and call anybody in OIS and say, can you set this up for me? Uh, we have the ability to do that ad hoc on the fly as the needs arise. So that gives us the ability to be a lot more responsive uh, for those kinds of needs when they arise. Okay, questions about groupware? Very good. I'm going to hand the microphone back to Angela. A little hot potato oh, yes, we will. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to clip it on because I'm going to hand it to Dr. Frieden in just a few seconds. I wanted to let you all know that to, to go through this process, we put together a groupware task force, and that task force was made up of 19 campus stakeholders from 17 er different areas across campus. So the goal was to just really have lots of different perspectives on this task force. And this email is for faculty and staff only. The students will continue to use their GusMail accounts through Google. Um, so it was made up of faculty and staff from across campus, and we had quite an array. We had someone from every college area. We had deans. We had someone from um, the physical plant we had a few techies we tried not to be very techie heavy because we knew that we needed different perspectives than just technology perspective we needed user perspective so um, that task force did have a very specific purpose and we went through some interesting processes to get to where we are and dr. Frieden is here today to share that with us hold on to I won't have this too long all right. Well, this was an easy task force to be on because, as you all know, we were in desperate need for a new email calendaring system. So everybody was on board to go with this. And 
It was also easy to uh, serve on this task force because it resembled a lot of our LMS task force and the processes that we went through for that. So as Angela said, we had um, a nice large group. We met on a regular basis at the beginning. It was almost uh, every couple of weeks, and then we met maybe uh, every month after that. So we've been continuing working on this for, for some time. But, you know, email and calendaring, just like the LMS, touch all of our lives. So we all have a big stake in this process. So I think it was really nice to have that many people serve on the task force. We started out <clears throat> actually assembling a list of all of our wants, needs, and desires if we could have any kind of email calendaring system that we could have. So that's how we came up with the uh, rubric. And I guess you'll probably share that with them in a little bit. But these were all of our, our uh, dream features that we would like to see in an email calendaring system. So we spent quite a bit of time assembling the rubric, putting that together. We also decided that there needs to be some standardization across campus for email because like Tim referenced, so many different email clients, uh, the calendaring system, people using a variety of calendars. There's nothing more aggravating for me and probably you as well. You want to schedule a meeting with someone, you go to corporate time, half of them may not have an account, so then you had to start the emailing telephone process. So that's another big bonus for having a group where product. Everybody will have the same thing. We also felt it was important that everybody be on IMAP across campus. Um, I don't know if you know what IMAP is, and I'm not even going to attempt to explain it, but <laughs> that was one thing that we wanted to see uh, this particular system support. Uh, another one was we wanted everybody to have a similar um, email address, like first name, last name, or first initial, last name. Um, that would make uh, referencing, again, much easier. So then the big task came uh, to find some products that were out there available for us. Of course, we had certain limitations as well. Budget was one. So that immediately limited a lot of the products. Uh, I actually served on a smaller task force looking for some solutions. And honestly, I bet I spent over a week trying to find some options for us. And I think altogether there were about five of us on that little task force, and we only came up with about four or five options that were out there. And so the two that you're going to be seeing today were two of those four or five that we found, but really these were the only two that were even feasible to use. So then uh, after that process, we brought those two products, or no, there were three actually. In the beginning, there were three that we brought forward to the larger task force. Immediately, one of them was eliminated. There was no way that it was even going to fly. Um, and so then we got input from the rest of the task force uh, regarding the remaining product. So we felt like the remaining two actually offered most of the features that we were looking for. And so those are the two you're going to be seeing today. I'm going to talk for a while, so I'll clip this back on. Okay. okay. So we did. We went through quite a process. We worked in small groups and went around the room, and we had large poster board stations at each group and or at, at, at several areas around the room, and everybody was assigned a station, and they would brainstorm at that station, and then they would switch and brainstorm at another one. And that's how we came up with our rubric, which you all are going to use in just a minute. And it really set the path for our direction. You probably saw the term up there, open source, and you heard Brenda mention the word budget. <laughs> Both of those things were really important to us. Um, two reasons why we looked at open source, and our thought was if we don't find the features that we need with an open source product, we'll go back and, and say, we just can't do it. We're going to have to look at purchasing a product. But there's two main reasons that we were looking at open source. And just to be clear, open source is um, software that's been developed um, that's, that folks have made available to the world for free. So um, open source at one time was kind of scary. It was a scary place to go. In today's world, it's lot, a lot less scary, especially in specific areas. 
in the area of group wear, there's, lot, there's several products out there. Um, like Brenda said, we found three or four. In the old days, you, you could go buy lots of different email systems. Well, in today's modern world, there's not a lot of options. Open Exchange, or I'm sorry, Exchange Servers and Outlook is about the, is about the most common uh, that you will find um, out there and in terms of a purchase service. So we, we looked at open source and um, open source has become something that's very common in the IT world today and it helps us a lot as users for things like applications that we download, things that we download from the App Store. Many of those things were developed through open source code. Along the years, open source um, in the area of groupware, um, there's a couple of people that have done it and done it well and we were able to kind of harness those products. So open source is inexpensive. It either is zero or, or very low level um, cost for support from experts that know, community experts that know um, how to deal with those products. And that was important to us because our budget is very small. We actually pay zero um, dollars per year for our email system that we have on campus. We've had it for a long time. It sits on an older box. So we have no budget for email right now. Um, and at the time that it was installed, like Tim said, it was very state of the art. The problem is we never upgraded it along the way and kept up with modern products and modern ways of doing business. The Oracle calendaring system is almost the same. I think we've had it anywhere from eight to 10 years. And um, we bought X number of licenses at that time and we've never upgraded since. We pay $3,300 a year for, for that kind of licensing. So our budget was extremely small and in these economic times we wanted to be very open-minded about what we looked at. In addition, our sister institutions are looking very hard at open source. We already have very, one very large institution in the state that uses all open source. Um, and as others are adopting new email systems, that's what they're looking at because of savings and just that the products are just that good now. Um, they can sustain an enterprise environment like we have. And as we read trade publications, we see in more and more of that. And so it wasn't a scary place for us to go, at least research, and we were very happy with where we came, where it came out in terms of feature sets. So that was the reason we looked at open source budget and it was just kind of the direction our state is going. We're being very encouraged by our state, by the way, to, um, to save money in the area of IT, like all of us in, uh, in every area are being encouraged to save money. But there's a real incentive for us to, because there's a push out there um, in regard to consolidation. And there's some things that make a lot of sense about consolidating in our state. Email's not something I'm ready to let go of. I, don't, I want us to have control over our email. I want it to be on Pitt State's campus and us, and us be able to handle issues when they come up. I don't like the idea of having to call someone else in a faraway world you know, on a, where my server sits. And so that consolidation piece is something else. If we can keep our costs low, I think that we'll have less push for consolidation. So that was another reason we looked at open source. Standards, Brenda and um, Tim talked really heavily about standards and I think it's really important that you understand how strongly the Groupware Task Force felt about standards. Um, one of our, our stations, our brainstorming stations when we met was about standards. And one of the, these are the, the three things that came up. Now, a lot of people didn't know how to express this in terms of IMAP, so I'm gonna, they just said, why can't I get my email from my smartphone? Why can't I, why when I read my emails at home, they're not on my computer when I get to work? And this comes back to IMAP. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Naming conventions are an issue. Using a standard product across campus is a real issue. We cannot support our clients well. We don't support our clients well because we aren't experts in every single one of those products that we use across campus. With whatever product we select, there will be intense training and it will be ongoing. In fact, we will have orientations every month as new employees start on campus to learn email and some of the other things that we do in our department. Right now, if we had an email training, we would have to have six, seven, or eight of those trainings to, to be able to really serve people well. Right now, we, we don't do that. We don't do any of that. So people are just kind of less left to figure it out or ask their neighbors. And no one really learns everything that they need to know about the email systems that we have on campus, which is a real frustration. In addition, not having a standard interface is difficult to deal with on the back end side of things. The things that Tim has to say, oh yeah, I gotta leave that on for Thunderbird or that off for Thunderbird. All of those things have to be dealt with. So every time that there's an upgrade or a change or there is a system outage, 
Tim has to deal with those things. Lastly, IMAP, I am going to attempt to explain this, so it's, gonna, it's going to be in very layman's terms because it is kind of a difficult thing to understand. There's really two major ways to deliver email. One is called POP, P-O-P, and you've probably heard of that before. The other is called IMAP. POP is how we originally delivered email when email first came into existence. And what that means is in the evening, if I went into my onto my home computer and I logged into my email and I read my emails and then the next day I came to work logged into my email and said thought I want I need to read that email that Michelle sent me last night it's not there it's not there because it's on my home machine it's sitting on my home machine and so I've already read it I don't get to see it again unless I go back home and read it right so that's a real frustration for people IMAP allows us to store all emails on a server and no matter what device we connect to it goes and fetches those emails from that server and brings it back to that device for us to read it there. So it's very convenient, especially if you're a mobile person. If you're not a mobile person and you don't care, you don't read your email at night or on your smartphone, it's not going to make a difference in your world, and that's okay. But for many of us and the growing number of us that are mobile and need to get emails wherever we are, this is a huge difference. This is a big deal for us. And so our campus has had IMAP for many years. That was one of the first things Tim did when he came here five and a half, six years ago. And we've moved a lot of people over to IMAP, but there have been some areas that have not moved over. So we're working with the technicians across campus to get everyone moved over to IMAP. And so if you, if you aren't on IMAP, um, and you haven't been asked, you will soon, because we send out a list regularly saying, these people are still on POP. We need them moved over before we make this big change, because the new system will be set up for IMAP and IMAP only. And that will give us the mobility and flexibility for those who want it. For those who don't, your world will not change. Any questions about those two pieces, standards and open source? Clarification, make sense? Okay, so pro what products were reviewed? These are the four that we brought back to the group, Citadel, Horde, Open Exchange, and Zimbra. And as Brenda said really quickly, it was obvious that Citadel and Zimbra came a lot closer to our feature list um, in our rubric than the others did. We were really had high hopes for Open Exchange because it's supposed to be um, an open source um, tool like Exchange server. Um, and I think it probably is a good product. The problem is it's developed in Germany and it was very difficult to get any support. And that was a huge issue for us. If we couldn't have community support in times of need, it was going to be a problem. And so the support we did find was in German. <laughs> and so we obviously weren't, none of us are, are fluent in German and, and struggled with that. That doesn't mean that this might not be a contender in the future um, if we ever have to change. But right now, Citadel and Zimber were the two that really had um, the features that our group felt like mattered. And many of you are probably thinking, why didn't I see Google up there? Google's not necessarily open source per se, but it certainly is a, has groupware solutions that would be perfect for us. It has calendaring, it has email, it has document repository, it has Google Plus, so it has the social networking piece. It has all types of collaboration pieces. They just opened up Google Drive, if any of you guys have heard of that. It's now available for download. So there's all these tools that Google has, and our students use Google, so why wouldn't we consider Google? And let me give you the background about this. I do believe Google might be in our future, um, but our state right now is, is, is very conservative about us, us, meaning Kansas agencies, storing um, university business outside of our country. Google cannot guarantee that the, the servers that they would store our data on would be located on U.S. soil. And yes, I called Google and said, hey, can we not figure out a way? And they said, we're Google. No, this is how we do business. We have lots of other schools that are doing this. Harvard does it. Stanford does it. None of those schools are inside Kansas. So this is a Kansas rule right now. I think that will change as Google proves to them that they are very cautious about where they locate those servers, and they have been. I, they sent me some very nice documentation about we do not locate servers in country X, Y, and Z um, that have any government or business types of um, accounts on them. 
but we're just not there yet in our state in doing that. I think that we'll see others push that forward in our state, and we'll see more and more of that. Um, and so Google could be in our future, and it would be a, a really good um, product for, for a university environment, but right now we're not there. So I wanted to kind of get that out of the way because most people say, why didn't we consider Google? And that's a great question because it is a great product. So I wanted to go over the survey res results real fast, just so you kind of know the kind of feedback that we got through the result through the survey that we had we, regarding groupware. And basically, we asked people, "How do you use email now? How are you using calendaring now? What kind of training would you want? Those kinds of things." We had 126 responses. 35% um, were faculty members. 63 were staff members. Um, most of the folks on campus say, I use Thunderbird as the interface to get to my email. And then surprisingly, a lot of people use, use Gusmail, which really surprised us because it is difficult to use. Our guess is that that's how people were trained and they you know, first learned how to use Gusmail and have never been trained any way different. And, and that makes sense because we certainly haven't said, let's have some Thunderbird trainings over the years or let's have Outlook trainings. Um, Outlook or Outlook Express comes in with 21%, and then there's a myriad of others in that 8%. I mean, I wish I could say most of them said they use this, this, or this. No, there's just a myriad of many other types of, of emails being used there. Electronic calendaring, this is no surprise this, uh, that most people use Oracle, but that 28% made me wonder, what are they using? Um, a few people use Outlook. Of course, if they're using Outlook to schedule anything on the calendar, they've got to be scheduling with someone else that has Outlook. You know, So um, that 28%, especially with group types of scheduling, made us wonder. And when we got to looking at what people responded, oh, that makes sense. They're using iCal and Google. Now, they may not be scheduling group schedules, but that's how they're managing their personal calendars and their, and their office calendars through iCal and Google. Those are both really awesome products. It makes sense. I can see why people would migrate to those um, in terms of being user friendly, much more so than Oracle. But you do lose that whole campus interconnectivity with that. Document repository, which is one of the features that our group felt really strongly about. Most people say, yeah, I look at, I keep documents that people send me or that I send people. I keep them in my email folders. I do not delete them because I want to go back and pull up those documents. Maybe instead of downloading them to my hard drive, this is where I keep them. Or when I'm very mobile, I can pull up a document someone sent me on my phone and look at it in an emergency or just a time that I need to answer a question. So 60% of the respondents said that, yeah, I do that, which is a good thing. That's a very positive thing, especially as we look through this process. Another question that we were very interested in was, when are we going to do this? Because Tim and Daryl and I are like, you know, it can't be soon enough. I mean, we're ready to make the change. And don't get me wrong, there's lots of things that need to be done um, to get us where we need to get, to, to get us to where we need to go. But we wanted to ask campus this question because there's also some other big changes that are happening on campus. For faculty, the new learning management system with Canvas is huge, and there's so much to learn with that system. It's a wonderful system. It's, it's very eloquently built. And, and designed, but there's a lot to learn with any new learning management system. So we were very concerned about what people would say. Okay, what, you know, when do you really want to do this? We knew that we really couldn't, our, our cutoff date was, we really can't, after September 15th, it, it's too late. We knew that we were very nervous about going past that date. And so when we got this information back, we were very happy. So at first we talked about maybe it should be a June install, Again, Tim and I cannot get this done fast enough in our minds. I mean, we want Daryl, we just want it done. When we started asking around about, what do you think about June? We got very um, clear feedback that don't do it in June, that's year end. Wait till after July. So I think that you'll start seeing some information coming out about um, our dates and what we're looking at for July. And our plan is to, we'll probably have email down over a weekend, we'll launch on a Monday. So that means the, flip, the switch will flip on a Monday and everything will look different. So the week before, we'll do some very intense training. We'll offer lots of different types of training. Our plan is to offer differentiated training because we know different people need different training, especially for the calendaring. We have administrative assistants that handle many people's calendars. They need a different type of training than others. And um, we also will have a special training for mobile devices. People can bring their mobile devices. We'll help them set them up, those types of things. Then we'll launch on a Monday 
day and then that week we'll again offer training and we'll also have a support area just for email and calendaring all that week and then if we need it the next week we'll have it the next week we're just going to kind of play it by year after that as fall comes around we'll do the same thing because there will be people that will be gone over the summer that maybe won't have touched email because they're laying on a beach in a faraway place and enjoying their summer and so we'll again offer those differentiated trainings so that people will have access to them So, as we go through these demonstrations, um, Daryl's so kind to hand out, first of all, there's a feature list that, of both products that, again, is derived from our stakeholder group, and it kind of gives you an idea of, of which products have those features, which don't, which are limited, have, but are limited, those kinds of things. And then you will have the full rubric um, to share back. What you will see is that Citadel has some features that you don't have now. Um, and what you will see is that Zimbra has many more features um, that you don't have now. Our hope was to bring you back a very apples to apples type of products, or two different apples to apples types of products, but that's just not how it worked out. The more we learned about Zimbra, the deeper the feature list got, and I think you'll see that as we go through the demonstrations. So what's going to happen is Tim's going to present on Zimbra. Zimbra is the white sheet, and it says that at the top. Citadel is the green sheet. So as you go through these demonstrations, please leave your comments. What we want in the end is a rating from zero to three. Three is the best you can get. Zero is non-existent. And if you'll put that over in, in the right-hand column, any comments that you want to make or questions you want to ask um, or thoughts you just want to leave us with, like you might consider this, guys, please feel free to leave in these blanks or there's a large blank area on the back of the page because we're documenting all of that information and using it as we begin you know, planning for training and FAQ sheets and informational areas on the web. So your feedback is critical to us. We've gotten, we have really received some excellent feedback. So um, just remember, Zimbra is white, Citadel is green, and we had one person in the very first session do it the opposite direction and have to, <laughs> she quickly had to change everything. So just remember that, and we're going to start out with Zimbra. You will see Tim will talk a little bit longer than Daryl because there are more features in Zimbra to share, and my guess is you'll have lots of questions about Zimbra um, along the way. So feel free to raise your hand and say, wait a minute, I didn't see this, I'm used to seeing this, where is it in Zimbra, where is it in Citadel? Any questions before we get started? Uh, as Angela said, uh, we're a small group. It's very informal. We're all family here. Please feel free to interrupt me uh, if I'm going too fast or if I gloss over something that uh, uh, you don't, I didn't make clear or you don't understand or you just have an additional question, something I didn't cover. Uh, the first thing I want to do here is set up uh, two email sessions with Zimbra because if I'm going to show sending emails, I need a sender and a recipient. If I'm going to make an appointment, I need somebody organizing the appointment and someone uh, to actually invite. So first of all, if you'll bear with me for just a minute, I will get signed in uh, with a couple of accounts so that we can give you uh, a, a good demonstration as to how some of the features work. We've put a demonstration system up at zimbra.pittstate.edu, and I've migrated a couple of months worth of email from the existing email system for all of your accounts over into uh, this demonstration Zimbra system. I've also taken uh, calendar appointments for those of you who use Oracle Calendar and brought those across into the Zimbra calendar for all of the appointments that uh, were put into the system from January 1 of this year. Uh, to, oh, probably sometime early last week. Uh, I just basically did that to kind of pre-populate uh, the Zimbra client with some stuff so you can go in there and create some appointments, look at some information, move emails around, create folders, uh, and have some, some content uh, in there to work with. <coughs> okay, let me get us <coughs> logged in here. I'm going to log in as myself first. And then I'm going to bring up Firefox and log in again as a different user.
this user's just mail test. Okay, after this session today, you can all go uh, try out Zimbra and Citadel virtually immediately. Uh, I was able to migrate everyone's email password from the existing system over to Zimbra. So if you go to zimbra.pittstate.edu right now and log in with the, the first part of your email address, the part to the left of the at sign, and the password that you use when you log into email, you can get in and see Zimbra right now. Uh, we'll send you an email with those instructions and a link you can click on uh, later on today so you'll have some more documentation about how to go and evaluate uh, uh, these two uh, yourself later. Okay, so let's get uh, a Zimbra interface up. The major components appear on tabs across the top here. Uh, the first one is mail, and this should look relatively familiar to you if you've used uh, Yahoo or Gmail, uh, this interface is not that foreign. Uh, you've got your email folders listed over here across uh, on the left side. Uh, the uh, emails, in this case I've got inbox selected, so the emails that exist in my inbox appear here. If I select one of them, I get a preview of uh, the contents of the email down here in the preview pane on the bottom. I do have the ability to change that around a little bit. If I go over here and say I'd really rather have a reading pane on the right, now it looks a little bit more like Outlook. If any of you use Outlook, you've got uh, the contents of the folder show up over here and the preview of uh, the emails appear to the right. I can also go in here and turn the reading pane off, giving me the ability to see as many emails as possible in, in one page. And if I want to actually view the contents, I have to double click on the message it opens the whole thing, uh, taking up all of that pane, and then click close to go back to the list. The other thing that I can do is view emails by message or by thread, by conversation. And I'll try to get to uh, somewhere that's got enough emails in there that you can see the difference. I think this one will work. Uh, if I go in here and change it from by message to by conversation, now you see, for one thing, the list gets a little shorter, and all of these little kind of sideways triangles appear. Basically, what it's doing is sorting all the emails, both those that I've sent and emails that have come in by subject. And all of the emails pertaining to a particular subject appear here when I expand uh, that particular group. So if I like having my emails organized that way, I can uh, turn it on by saying I want to view by conversation. If I don't want to do that, if I want to see them strictly in chronological order based upon the folder that I'm in, uh, I can say I want to view by message. The other uh, things that we can do, let me jump back up here to the inbox briefly. The other things that you have up here available are the standard things. Uh, you can move a selected email into a different folder. You can print an email. Uh, you can reply, reply all, forward. Now this is new. Those of you who may have a Yahoo account have seen something similar. Zimbra learns from us when we tell the application, what is and what is not spam. So if something shows up in your inbox, instead of going into the junk folder, which is where Zimbra will put emails that it thinks is spam, if you find something in your inbox that uh, you feel like is spam and should have gone in the junk folder, select the message and click the spam button. That does two things. It takes it out of your inbox and moves it down to junk. And it also says to Zimbra, hey, tonight when you do your housekeeping processing, examine that email and learn from it because it's an example of spam. Uh, so it gives the uh, email system the ability to learn and adapt because heaven knows the spammers are always changing and adapting and modifying the way they send their emails to try to defeat uh, spam filters like the one that's built into Zimbra. The other side of that equation, and I don't have anything in junk to make it uh, easily visible, is but I think you can see it, is this not spam button. Uh, if something sh was to show up in my junk folder and I looked at that and said, that's not spam, that's really uh, a valuable email. If I selected it and clicked the not spam button, it would move it up into my inbox and again, it would tell Zimbra, this evening when you do your housekeeping, 
Here's an example of an email that you incorrectly tagged as spam. Uh, use that as an opportunity to learn some characteristics about that email so you'll be a little more accurate in the future. So uh, that's kind of the uh, real quick and dirty on email. I'm not going to spend a lot more time here because I think all of us have had uh, enough opportunity to interface with email that this is not going to be, uh, the concepts here are not really that, uh, that new to us. The next one over is address book. Everybody begins with two address books, one called contacts and one called emailed contacts. The contacts address book, you create entries yourself by hand and you'll notice that there's just a huge amount of information that you can gather about inf individuals and enter into uh, a contact record. One of the things we're going to hopefully do with the global contact list that's, that will be built into the system is to dip into all of our contact information that's stored in GUS and pre-populate uh, the global address list with all of that information. So, uh, one of the things that I have to do, and I'm sure you guys do too, if I need to call somebody across campus and I don't have their extension uh, committed to memory, I jump on the website and do a people search and find the, uh, and find the extension. If we can include that information here, I would be able to jump into Zimbra type the first few characters of the first or last name, and up would pop Tim Pearson. Uh, the building that he's in is Kels. His office is 157L. His extension is 6562. So you could get all of that kind of, of uh, additional information about me uh, by doing that. Uh, then emailed contacts. This is a folder that is maintained by the system. Any person who sends you an email or anyone that you have sent an email to gets automatically added to emailed contacts so that if you need to contact them again, uh, their information will be remembered. Now, all it's remembering here is uh, name and email address, and it's possible to go in and delete these, but it's basically a way, we had questions uh, yesterday, what about emailing students? Is the new address book going to have all of the student accounts? And unfortunately, with them being on uh, Gmail, we're not going to be able to integrate that uh, user list with the uh, address book in Zimbra. But once a student sends you an email, then their email address and name will appear in the emailed contacts. You know the student's name, you can begin to type the first few letters of their first or last name, and that student should be suggested as one of the possible recipients for this uh, email that you're composing. So uh, the email contacts is something that's basically maintained automatically. If I've got one that keeps popping up and it's, it's annoying me and I want to make it go away, you can jump into email contacts, select one of them, click the delete button, and uh, that one will go away until uh, that email, someone sends you an email from that address again. In addition to that, you can create additional address books. You uh, click this button right here to do that. You can have as many of them as you want and you can share them with any other user on the system. So we could have a departmental address book that had uh, contacts that we all uh, used uh, quite frequently and we could share that among ourselves. So uh, address books are capable of being created ad hoc and shared on an ad hoc basis so that you can uh, collaborate with contact information with anyone else on the system that you want. Okay, questions about email or address book? Sir? Are we responsible then for importing our existing contacts to whatever client we're using? We're going to try to help you with that. Okay. Uh, we, we've talked about that. That's a question that's come up uh, repeatedly in the sessions that we've had so far. There is an import uh, function in this application. What we've got to do, one of the things about open source is we have to become the experts. So to be able to do that, I'm going to dig into the manuals and find out how the format for that import file uh, needs to be, and I think we can accomplish that. I think we'll be able to import uh, contacts from your Outlook or your Thunderbird, because uh, I'm sure that's a common uh, request. There may even be someone in the open source community who's written uh, an application that we can use to do that. I haven't gone to look yet, but it's possible. Yes? Contacts in your iPhone? we will be able to give you an application that will connect the contacts in your mobile device with the contact list uh, 
in Zimbra, in this case, and those two can be synchronized so that if you create a new contact on your mobile device, that contact will appear uh, in Zimbra. If you create a new contact in Zimbra, that contact will appear on your mobile device. So we can give you two-way synchronization of calendar, contacts, and email. Uh, Yeah, in email, right. The whole contact list in iPhone, that's a whole another program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me, I don't have an iPhone, so I'm, yeah, Angela does, so she's probably better to field that. Okay, thanks. That's a whole other, there might be an interface app before that someone's created, but it's not built for that. It's built for phone dialing. Okay. All right. Any other questions about uh, mail or address book? Okay, then let's jump over to Calendar. This will be the replacement for Oracle Calendar. In the beginning, everyone gets one calendar called Calendar. I can create additional ones, as many as I like, and I can share those with others if I choose to do so, and we'll, we'll go through some of that. Let me begin by just showing you how to create a simple appointment just as a reminder for me. Uh, if I go over here and say, let's see, I, at Thursday, uh, from 10 to 11, I have a dentist appointment, and I want to put a, an appointment in there for that. I go over here to the 10 a.m. slot with the mouse, hold down the left mouse button, and drag down to 11, and that then opens up the start and end time for this appointment. And when I release the mouse button, this quick add thing comes up, and I say the subject is uh, dentist appointment. The location is dentist office, let's say. Uh, display, show this as out of office, make it public so others can see it. I could make it private, and then they'd see that I had an appointment, but they wouldn't be able to see what it was. But this is going to be a public one. If, since you can have multiple calendars, this gives you the ability, if you had more than one, if we'd created a second one already, you could select which calendar you wanted to put the appointment in. The start date and time and end date and time are pre-populated because we use the click and drag method here. We don't want to repeat, and we would like uh, a reminder 30 minutes before, and we'd like that reminder uh, sent to us by email. So if I'm creating an appointment for just myself, that's all the information I need to fill in. I click OK, and there that appointment shows up on my calendar. Now from this point forward, if somebody was trying to, to organize a group meeting and they were looking to add me for a meeting on Thursday, that dentist appointment from 10 to 11 would create a little green uh, Tim's Busy box in the Free Busy uh, display as someone else was trying to organize uh, a meeting. So they would know that between 10 and 11, I wasn't going to be available. Okay, let's do the same thing, but this time let's create an appointment where we're going to invite others. Let me just go down to the next hour and say between 11 and noon, we'll create another appointment. And let's call this one a uh, group where uh, review. And the location, I'm going to say conference room. And I'm going to begin typing the first few letters of that. And you'll notice that it fills or that it suggests this resource called conference room. Uh, those of you who have Oracle Calendar accounts are aware that you can schedule conference rooms. We've got those put in the system. In the demo system for Zimbra, I only put in one and called it conference room. Uh, but by setting that location, then just like in Oracle Calendar, that reserves that room for this meeting just like it would do if you included a conference room in Oracle. Uh, I'm going to display it as busy, mark it as public, the times are correct, not repeating, I'd like to be notified. In this case, it's just down the hall, so five minutes before is good enough. But where do I invite others? There's not anything there to do that. To be able to make it a group appointment, I need to go down here and click More Details. That brings up a larger display and begins here the process of giving me free busy information. Uh, you'll see a green line where I'm proposing to start the appointment, a red line where the appointment will end, and then uh, some colored blocks that indicate uh, whether or not, or what, in this case, just uh, Tim Pearson is doing uh, during several hours uh, on that date. 
let's go ahead and add uh, another attendee. I'll begin to type the first few characters of the mail test account, say I'd like for them to attend. When I do that, they appear down here in the free busy search, and if there were appointments for that person, uh, it would appear down here as a colored block. What I'm looking for is a column that's all white. If I see all white, I know everybody's available and this is a good time to have this meeting. Let me also invite Angela. I'm going to type the first few letters of her first name and all of the Angelas uh, in the system appear and I can pick the one uh, that I'm wanting to invite to the meeting and that works sending emails as well. You can begin to type the first few characters of the first or last name and uh, the system will suggest and, and display for you all the matches that it finds in the global address list. So we want to invite Angela as well and uh, then we say okay we're going to have uh, myself, uh, the mail test user, Angela Neria and the conference room. Those are the four uh, entities that are going to be involved in this uh, appointment and I'm going to click the send button. Uh, at that point, I've now sent this email uh, message out to attendees, and yeah, I'll let you do that, I guess. Okay, now let me jump over to the mail test user, and if we jump into mail tests inbox, you'll see that this user has an email from Tim Pearson uh, titled Groupware Review, and it shows down here in a little tiny calendar the time that I propose, if I had other calendar events around that, they would show there as well. And it shows who the invitees are here, where it's going to be held, uh, who the organizer was, what the time was. And I have some buttons up here that don't normally appear when I receive an email. Uh, I've got accept, accept tentatively, decline, propose new time. Uh, and in each one of those, I have the ability to reply or respond or treat this in one of three different ways. I can accept the email or accept the appointment and send an email to the organizer letting them know that I've accepted it. I can send a reply but edit what that reply is going to say or I can silently accept the appointment and it won't send uh, a notification back to the organizer. However, they'll still be able to know that I've accepted it. Let's do one where uh, we're going to edit the reply so you can see what it looks like. Uh, this is now going to send something back to Tim Pearson, the organizer. Uh, it plugs in this sentence by default that says, yes, I will attend. Then I can just add additional information in here. And I'm going to say, you bring the cookies. And click send. And at that point, now if we pop back over to Tim Pearson's account, here's a new email. We'll bring that up uh, to preview it here. Oh, I don't have preview turned on. Excuse me. Hang on just a second. Reading pane at the bottom. There we go. And now you can see that the user mail test has accepted the invitation. And uh, I've got a little green checkbox by him. And it shows over here, again, uh, a graphical representation of when that meeting is going to be. The conference room also sent me an acceptance uh, email saying that... Uh, uh, the conference room is available at that time and I get confirmation that, uh, that it has been scheduled and it's reserved. If I go over here to the calendar and take a look at this appointment that I created, if I just hold the mouse there, it pops up a box that gives me some information, some detail about this appointment. And what I'd like for you to look at is down at the bottom where it says attendees. I see that one has accepted, one uh, still needs action. So the mail test user has accepted the appointment. Uh, Angela hasn't said one way or the other uh, yet. So this gives me the ability to look real quickly, even if someone decided to accept silently and say, I'm not going to send an email uh, back set to Tim telling him that I'll attend this meeting. I'm just going to click accept uh, and don't notify the organizer. I'll still be able to see uh, that uh, you've accepted the meeting. I can also see it if I open this by double clicking and bring up some detail, green check marks appear here in the free busy list by the folks who have accepted the meeting and this time in their free busy schedule turns blue and if we slide down here we'll see the legend that says blue means busy so I can see a graphical representation here in a little bit more detail showing me uh, who the attendees are who's accepted uh, and who hasn't yet uh, another thing that you can do 
quite easily uh, with this calendar Im implementation is reschedule things. So let's say for some reason we're not going to be able to meet on Thursday from 11 to noon. We're going to have to change this meeting to Friday. So we just grab it and drag it over. Uh, and then as soon as I release the mouse, it says, do you want to edit the appointment modification message? Uh, otherwise, it'll just send a standard message out that says this appointment's been modified. Uh, and here's the new information. Yeah, I want to give everyone a reason so they can explain to explain to them why it's been modified. So here's my appointment. I'm going to get ready to send the notification. Oh, excuse me. I must have missed it. I did. Pardon me. So basically, uh, if we go back over here, you're just going to see the standard uh, email that comes out saying that the meeting has been modified. So it says the following meeting's been modified. It shows uh, the new start and end time. Now it's on Friday. And uh, the information that's been changed appears up here. And again, I have the ability to accept, mark it tentative, decline, propose a new time. One of the things that's different in Zimbra over Oracle Calendar that we've been using in the past there was a checkbox that said, would prefer another time uh, in Oracle, but you didn't get to say what time you would prefer. Uh, in Zimbra, if I click Propose New Time, it brings up uh, basically another appointment uh, interface and lets me suggest a different day, start, and end time uh, for this meeting. So I can send that a much more uh, specific proposal back to the organizer saying, I would prefer to have this meeting uh, at this time if possible. So uh, that's the, uh, let's just say we're going to accept without notification this time. And we'll jump back over to the organizer's calendar. And if we look now, we see that once again, the mail test user has accepted the modified appointment and uh, we haven't heard back from Angela yet. So that's kind of calendars in a nutshell. One other thing real quickly, uh, multiple ways of viewing your calendar, just like in Oracle. You can have a day view, which gives you an expanded view with each hour of the day listed. You can have a work week view that uh, eliminates Saturday and Sunday. You can have a full week view, which includes Saturday and Sunday. You can have a month view, which shows all of your appointments for the month. Uh, you can have a list. This just shows all of your appointments in chronological order uh, by the start date and time. Uh, you can uh, look at, at your schedule and see uh, what, the, what your conflicts are, and you can go into a free busy view and take a look at uh, where, uh, in this case, where I'm busy. So uh, if we go back over here to, excuse me, I need to get back to view. I'm clicking the wrong thing. Go back up here to a work week view. Uh, and that's the one that comes up by default, is this uh, work week view. Okay, uh, other questions about calendaring? Yes? I see at the top you've got uh, information for people within your office that are going to be out. Oh, yeah, these daily note things? The daily note yeah. Things. Okay, sure, let me show you how that works. Uh, let's create one. We want to make a new all-day appointment. And if I display the time as free, I can just say T. Pearson Vacation Day, click OK, and that appears uh, up there in the top area. So it's very easy. You just create an all-day appointment, show time as free. That way it doesn't involve a start at an end time, uh, and it appears up there in the top. So that's the analog of an Oracle Daily Note. Yes? Uh-huh, you can. Yes, you can. You can share that notification. Or if you put it on a shared calendar, they'll see it. Right, right, exactly. Not necessarily. If you made that appointment on, or made this entry on the departmental, as long as you had the little checkbox next to that check, you'd see it. In both places. In both places, exactly, exactly. So this is how you deactivate viewing a calendar is clear the checkbox. All the appointments on the calendar called calendar just disappeared. Uh, when I check it, they come back. Over here, if I uh, clear the checkbox on the department one, uh, I don't have any appointments over there, uh, but that would make those go away. So what you're seeing is both of those separate calendars. 
both of those calendars overlaid on top of one another. Okay, I'm, I'm not giving Daryl much time and I apologize. Let me just gloss over the next three tabs here real quick. Uh, the task list basically allows you to create personal tasks and assign uh, a priority and a percentage complete uh, and a status to those. You can also create a shared task list and share if you've got a group, a cohort that's working on a project you could break that project down into individual tasks, assign those tasks to people. They could go into the shared task list and update the percentage complete, and we could all see kind of at a glance how that's proceeding. It's kind of poor man's project management is what the uh, task list does for us. And then, to give you just another real brief overview, briefcase is Zimbra's version of the P drive. It gives you the ability to create folders and place documents in the folders. You'll see here that everybody gets one called briefcase and I've created another one here called Zimbra documents. And in that folder I've got some additional uh, Word documents and, and some Adobe PDFs. I can, unlike the P drive, I can choose to share this folder with someone else or with a group of other people. So if I decided I wanted to do that, I could right click here and say share folder and who do I want to share with? Well, my friend mail test. So I'd like to share and then I get to give them or to decide what role. Are they only able to view the files in my shared folder? Are we going to give that person the ability to edit, add and remove files in that folder? <clears throat> or if we grant administration or administrative role, I'm basically giving up ownership of the folder because that would mean that the person I'm granting these rights to would have the ability to share it with others. So let's give uh, mail test manager information. We'll send the standard message and we'll click OK. Let me jump over here real quick and we'll look at the email and it says a share has been created and I'll click accept share and we'll call it that and I'll make it paint. There it is and there's all those documents that were in it. Okay, so I did share it. I shared it the last time I gave this presentation. I apologize for that but there are the documents. And if I had added something, if I went back over to the, to the Tim Pearson user and put another document in here, it would show up immediately uh, in the other uh, user's uh, version of this folder. Uh, and I'm gonna leave the rest of this uh, kind of for you all to experiment with. Yes? Are there file size limitations? We can set them, but we haven't decided what we might set them at. Uh, we've, we've kind of talked about, we, got, we need to make some kind of a limit so that if the system got into some kind of loop where it was adding things over and over and over, if we didn't have a limit of some kind, it could eventually fill up the hard drive and bring the whole system down. So we're going to try to create some kind of limit, but it's going to be very large, whatever, whatever limit we do create. Okay, I'm going to hush and let Daryl give us a real quick <laughs> overview of Citadel, and I hope in just a second you'll understand uh, why Zimbra took most of the time. These are not apples to apples. I'll go over some stuff real quick so you can see a few of the differences. In this case, I'm just going to open one. I'm not going to uh, send back and forth for this. This is the, the front page of Citadel. It can be changed. It doesn't have to be the lobby. It can be any room. Citadel calls folders rooms. And once you enter here, there's this tab or button over here called Go to Next Room. It's, it's a quick way to scan through any shared room that you have to see if there's anything new in there. So I've got new mail, new sent items. Once it goes through all that, it goes back to the lobby. The tabs are on the left. This is my personal mail folder, just my inbox. If I create a message, it, just like a... Just like in uh, Zimbra, it'll pull from the global address book if I start typing, typing a message. I can add an attachment. There's no spam check button, or no, no button, at, sorry. There's no button up here to show uh, spam. It relies on a third party spam thing. So, well, we have one of those, but it relies on that. It doesn't have built in spam. Here's a calendar. I can hover over and see information on any of these meetings. This is this user's personal calendar. There's a month view. And there's a day view. If I don't like where a meeting's at and want to move it, I can't move it that way, but I can double click it and change the, the time.
If I want to add a meeting, I have to use the add new event button up here. There's no, this interface doesn't allow for doing it the same way that Tim showed. Now when I add a meeting, I can select attendees. It does have a busy search. Typing in here doesn't pull anything up. I have to click the contact button and I can pull users up there. There's no uh, alarm in here. There's no, nothing to give me an alarm as far as a time frame or a, an email or a pop-up notification. Contacts, these are just contacts that I've contacted, the frequent contact list. Let's, uh, let's go down here. Tasks is similar, but I don't have a percentage. I have either a complete or not. And you can sort by categories. I'm sure I'm probably buzzing this real fast. You don't even see what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorting by categories just to see what's in that category. Now here's all the shared folders. They're created on floors. This one over here, my folders or my personal folders. The top one, the 0026.cal, that is somebody else's folder that I've made this user a designee of. Unfortunately, it names it a number. So as long as I've only got one, I'm good. But if there's more, there's got to be a better way to differentiate between the, the other person's calendars. Yeah, at this point, I haven't found a better way. That doesn't mean it's not there. Remember, this is open source, so yeah. we are the experts on it. We can't call Microsoft and say, can you come generate this for us? So. I've been re enabling features as we go and finding, determining that. So, um, Shared folders over here. This is a shared calendar. So this, if I wanted to create a calendar, I would go in the advanced area or create a shared folder, a shared room. Create a new room. I can make it any one of these types of rooms. I can put it on any floor. Let's put it in Kels, make it a calendar. And it's, I'm making a public one, I create it. If I go back into, and I don't have that fixed, okay. Um, then I can, that, since it's public, it's shared with everybody, but I can go in and give specific users the rights to, to edit it. Anything under my folders, let me highlight that. These can all be shared, but they cannot be shared by the user themselves. They've got to contact us to get them shared. It's not, it, that doesn't give the power to the user to be able to share these. But any other floor, any, any room on any other floor can be shared by anybody. These are all the logged in users, and I can do a chat from here. Chris is going to wonder why he keeps getting messages from me, from somebody named Demo. Um, also under summary, the top one, it's got all my meetings for the day. Here's my email, and here's the login users again. There are a few things. That's like the spam checking. I don't know if you saw, but there's a built-in spell checker in Zimbra. Citadel doesn't have one built into the application. It uses any add-on you might have in the browser, but it doesn't have one built into Citadel itself. And that's it in an extremely fast nutshell. Any questions? <laughs> yes, does Zimbra have the chat functionality? Zimbra does. Let me okay. come over. Ooh, I'm going to stand next to Daryl, so whoever you ask the question of, the microphone will pick it up. Uh, yes, Zimbra also offers the chat functionality. Other questions? Okay. Uh, remember that. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Just from looking at the feature list, it looks like Zimbra is the no brainer. What's the, is, there a, is there a sales, sales pitch for the other one? I mean, is there a reason that they both offer features that we don't currently have. Zimbra definitely does have a lot more features than Citadel does. Citadel is much simpler and it's a different philosophy, but Zimbra has far more features. What we, this is what we came back with. You know, we do have apples and oranges here, but we wanted to give campus the opportunity to see both products and understand the process that we went through to get to these products. 
So if you want to leave your rubrics here today, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you will receive an email in just a few minutes on how to log into both products and play with them through May 4th. So if you want to keep your rubric and then mail it to us, there's directions on the bottom of who to mail it to. But if you're like um, Dr. O'Brien and, and say, you know, have a, have a pretty strong feeling about one or the other, you're more than welcome to leave your rubrics today. Okay? Yes. No, no, no. That's just for the demo system. So that the email address, that way, since the email has that different ending part, you can actually send email from the demo system to your regular account or from your regular account into the demo system. That's why the difference. But uh, after we would switch, your email address wouldn't change unless you're like my friend over in OIS, uh, Colby Wachinski. Right now, his email address is cwachin. We will be able to offer Colby C. Wachinski now for his email address. Now, that doesn't mean that he has to go back to change. No. They, you know, everybody that's ever sent me an email, I have a new email address. Both email addresses will work right. for him. And so, and so I noticed that one person on here, Debbie, you have a one. I said, even if you're, you may not want that anymore. Yeah. You might be able to do the middle initial barometer or whatever works for you. We don't, we don't have to do anything. Thanks, folks.